All right, we're about to start broadcasting. Okie dokie. This Hangout On Air is live. This is Sound Booth Theater Live. Thanks for everybody who's... Publication. In the books, um, for, for lit RPG and game lit readers, it's probably fairly familiar. It's a VR MMO, a female main character, and she's trapped in a jungle, um, has a lot of questing and adventures and city building and sarcasm, which is one of my favorite parts. Um, the sequel just came out. Uh, it was supposed to be yesterday, but it, surprise, got put live a little early. So it's been out a couple days now, and it's starting to shoot up the ranks as well. And I'm just super happy with it. Congratulations. Thanks. You have a nice voice. You could be an audiobook narrator. Uh, <laughs> I listen to my cassette lots of times to write the books and I listen to myself and I just, I can't even stand to, to hear myself talk. <laughs> neither, neither can I. I think and that's a pretty profession. common experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your uh, writing career in general and how you, how you started, uh, how you came across lit RPG and game lit and uh, what inspired you to, to write in it? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, my first career out of college was as a video game programmer, and I worked on lots of different MMO games. Um, and I left that hmm, a few years ago um, to try some writing, and I did short stories at first. And then I started writing fantasy books. and. I guess actually when I saw the first lit RPG books, I thought, oh my gosh, I don't think I could, I don't think I could read those because I don't, I don't know if, uh, if it would just feel cheesy or whatever. But then finally I gave it a try and I just was, it was, it kind of combined everything that I liked about games without the grinding, <laughs> all the emotions and everything. And I just, you know, I just loved it. And so I decided to write my own. And it's a great way to take my two careers and put them together. Yeah, uh, it, se it seems like a lot of authors who are accessible in the genre have had um, experience writing for video games, at least, or, or working in the video game world. So that's, that's a pretty, pretty common story. And uh, I, I think I think that does make better lit RPG books when the the author has like, experience in the actual field um so uh yeah so what what do you think uh separates your series from the the other lit rpgs out there do you think i'd say that i took some of my fantasy writing and plotting and character development and tried to make the books accessible to fantasy readers as well so that it's not just the stats on the page, though I wanted to put them in as well. I really like the numbers and having my formulas on the back end and all of that. But that there's characters you can relate to and sort of experience the game and the book with them. And it's not just for gamers. It's also just for fantasy readers. Right, and I, Go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. I was just going to say, because uh, you've already got two. Let's see. I don't know if just one of them came out first, or if you have another pen name that you're doing uh, fantasy in. Oh, no, wait, no, you have you have quite a few fantasy books already out. On, I do, on I do. I have two, I have a trilogy and a complete series, and then another series that I'm releasing kind of along the, sa at the same time as I'm doing this series, though I'm having so much fun with this series that I'm going to be probably doing two more books in this before I... Oh give something back to my fantasy readers. Well, two, two more on top of books one and two. I will so, say like, that yeah. I've really enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed the characters in this book a lot. Um, I can I can see what you're saying about combining the sort of the fantasy genre with the lit RPG. I, I really truly enjoyed narrating this and I look forward to reading the other ones too and hopefully awesome. narrating them. Yeah, thanks Annie. Yeah, I'm glad. I, I did get a lot of reviews from people who hadn't tried the genre before and you know jumped in and, and liked it and then people that that were 
were were fans, but had kind of gotten tired of of some of the things they were seeing, which is is not that those. I mean, they obviously appeal to a wide base, but it's nice to try to grow the genre a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just doing a few scenes here. Um, let's see. You gave me a list of ideas. Um, you have chapter four plus the first scene of chapter seven. Okay. So the, these are, these are connecting scenes, like sort of. Yeah. Like, Cause there's leave out five and six. I, I think those are maybe like, uh, scenes where, uh, the point of view switches over to maybe like Emerson and mm -hmm. Williams. is that right? Yeah. And I, I think that it just depends on how much, uh, Annie wants to read how her voice, how long it works. But, um, the chapter four, I think starting about, there was a halfway through kind of makes a complete scene along with chapter seven. Okay. Cool. All right. So I'm going to flip over to chapter four here. What's the first line of the scene? Let's see. Are, are you wanting us to start right at the beginning of chapter four? No, I think the first line, pardon me while I narrate. <laughs> um, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. It is, I believe, all of chapter four. Okay. It's uh, It starts, I have the outtake saved out here with Devin tiptoed toward the fire ring. Okay, cool. So we'll start on chapter four and uh, I'll be doing the male voices. Uh, let me close this door so we get a little bit less reverb. And Annie, you can take it away. I haven't found it yet. Hold on. Oh, there's a... Do you know how to do the table of contents? Devin tiptoed yep. toward the fire ring. All right. Whenever you're ready. All right. Chapter four. And fortunately, she seemed to have lost Agro when she died, meaning she was no longer the person he wanted to kill more than anything in the world. The ogre simply looked down on her, beady little eyes narrowed in a glare. His weapon, his weapon leaned against the far side of the stone chair. Uroquat wore just three pieces of clothing, Thick pants that ended in a ragged hem just below the knees, plus a pair of forearm guards that extended over his elbows. The armor looked well made, and the ogre probably got a defensive bonus from his thick skin. But he didn't appear as powerful as the rest of the tribe seemed to think. She wondered what had made a group of humans decide to swear fealty to a semi-intelligent brute. Mm, you sorry for disrespect, Uroquat? the ogre said, leaning forward as he laid a hand on the club. Uh, yeah, I suppose so, she said, shuffling her feet before adding, sorry. No more run away without paying debt? No, I'll pay first. He sat back with a satisfied look and snorted. Devon waited. At least the sun was sinking behind the treetops now, and the air had gone from sauna hot to almost tolerable. The ogre yawned. His open mouth smelled like onions and stagnant water. She took a step back before speaking. So, how do I repay you? You not ready for that. Uh, but you said I owed you. Must prove being sorry first, he said as a pop-up appeared in her vision. Uroquat is offering you a quest. Uroquat is offering you a quest. Repent your grievance. Excuse me, repent your grievous error. Before repaying the copious material expenditures and sizable opportunity costs involved in your rescue from Ishildar's stone guardian, you must first guardian, you must first regain esteem with the tribe's leader. Objective gain five hundred reputation with your acquired. Reward Congratulations. You'll be back where you started. Accept yes or no. Devon blinked. Seriously? Opportunity cost? With a sigh, she focused on the prompt and selected why to accept the quest. Who came up with this stuff? She muttered. Uroquat gestured toward a small tent. 
the flap lifted, and a slight man shuffled out, looking down his nose despite his stature. I am in charge of the tribe's administration. He spoke with ill-concealed pride. Our glorious leader was rightly impressed by the precision in my communications. Before leaving El Terra City to join the tribe, I matched legal dealings for the city's guild of bankers. A lawyer in charge of her quest objectives. Fantastic. Fine, whatever. Can you tell me how I'm supposed to gain these 500 reputation points? The man sneered. Well, now please don't take this as formal legal advice, seeing as you have not officially retained my services. But I will disclose the following. Our esteemed leader has a particular loathing for snakes. Uroquat's fist tightened around the end of his club. His calves clenched and bulged. Devon took another step back. Slidey things, Uroquat growled. Not natural. His tiny eyes grew distant as his cheek twitched. And there are snakes in the surrounding jungle? Devon asked. The lawyer's eyes flicked to the ogre. He nodded quickly, but sliced the air with his hand as if to suggest she speak no more of it. Devon's gaze strayed to the wall of greenery to the, at the edge of the village. As much as she'd enjoyed her training in unarmed combat, she wasn't keen for more. Can the tribe spare a weapon? I'd be much more effective that way. Uroquat shivered as he shook off his paralysis. He picked up his club, looked from it to her, then shook his head. He flicked a finger in the lawyer's direction. Mm, give something to Starborn. She serve Uroquat's glory now. With a beleaguered sigh, the lawyer pulled a rusty blade from a sheath on his belt and handed it over. You have received Rusty Knife. This blade looks as if it has opened many letters over the years, perhaps while in a swamp. One to three damage. Five out of ten durability. Devon looked down at her Devon looked down at her feet. And perhaps shoes of some sort? Uroquat's face turned a mottled brown as blood rushed to his cheeks. He leaned forward, snarling, then lifted a single foot. His black toenails were cracked, and calluses in his, on his heels had split and bled and split again. When he wiggled his toes, the stretch of the stench of ripe cheese assaulted her. You think you better than Uroquat? He bellowed. Deserve shoes when esteemed leader wear none. Devon backpedaled so fast her heel caught on a stone from the firing ring. She toppled backward, landing hard on her butt. No, you're esteemed. Of course not. Please accept my apologies. Your gloriousness, the lawyer hissed. Pl please accept my apologies. Your gloriousness. Slowly. Uroquat relaxed. Fine. Now go. You now conquest for tribe of Uroquat. Devon scrambled to her feet and hurried away from the throne. Beneath the forest canopy, the shade was deepening as the sun sank lower. A quick look at her fatigue bar showed that it was 30% full. Maybe she should rest before beginning her war on the fearsome jungle snakes. It was probably time to grab some real-world sleep, too. She headed to Hesbeck's hut. I was wondering if I could borrow your cot, she said. I need to rest. Hesbeck snorted. <laughs> you're welcome in here, but you're not taking my bed. Where, then? Hesbeck pointed at, at a relatively flat section of the earthen floor. With a sigh, Devon shuffled over and laid down. She closed her eyes and focused her awareness on the logout button. When you hunt, Hesbeck said, save what you can from the kills. Some among us have coin and items to sp or items to spare, and personal interests beyond Uroquat's desires. Oh? Devon opened her eye. Hesbeck shrugged. A few of us wonder whether we made the right decision in coming out here. Interesting. Thanks, I'll salvage what I can. With that, 
Devin logged out. I love doing your quads voice. <laughs> I love your quads voice. <laughs> Me too. I think it's sending her to darkness is my last line. Yep. Okay. All right. Chapter seven. Moonlight filtered through the holes in Hesbeck's hatched roof. On the other side of the hut, the medicine woman slept on her side, a thin blanket covering her legs. Her light snores joined the buzzing of night insects from outside. Devin sat up and pushed her hair out of her eyes. Gathering the loose strands, she pulled off the leather cord that held the disintegrating braid, rewove the strands, and tied the braid back in place. Enough aimless stumbling through the game world. It was time to make some progress, start carving a name for herself. As she crept out the door, she tested her grip on the knife, rolling it in her hand until it nestled comfortably in her palm. Her feet had toughened while she rested, and the little pebbles embedded in the earth didn't hurt as she strolled toward the edge of the village. She passed the fire ring, now full of smoldering coals, a frame of sticks held an iron roasting spit with bits of char meat still clinging to the metal. Devin's stomach growled, reminding her that hunger was a stat in this game. She sidled over and plucked the crisped flesh from the spit. It tasted like burned dirt, but the ache in her stomach faded. She jumped when a loud snore came from the stone chair. Apparently, Euroquat didn't leave his throne, even to sleep. His head had fallen forward, and drool ran over his chin and down his chest, glistening in the moonlight. Devon curled her lip and moved on. The edge of the forest. At the edge of the forest, she paused to listen. The darkness under the canopy seemed impenetrable. With a shrug, she shoved aside the first branches and stepped into the jungle. The screeches of birds and churring of insects grew louder. Devon moved slowly attempting to bend rather than break the twigs and vines as she passed. But, to her ears, her passage was like a snorting warthog crashing through the undergrowth. She definitely needed to spend some time leveling her stealth skill. If the game had such a thing. Ever so slowly, gray shapes began to resolve from the surrounding ink. She squinted and could make out a dangling curtain of vines. You have gained a skill point. Plus one, dark vision. Well, that was something. Even if she didn't find any snakes before dawn, she'd get something out of this adventure. She pressed deeper into the jungle. Strands of spider web tickled her face. A dense mass of vines tangled her path. She tried to press through, but the foliage resisted. Grunting, she hacked at the thick stems. Finally, one parted. You have gained a skill point. Plus one-handed slashing. Plus one, one-handed slashing. Now try cutting an enemy. Yeah, if I could find one, she muttered. Abruptly, light flared, painting the jungle stark white. A growing sphere descended from the treetops and bobbed in front of her face. So you aren't the champion of Ishildar after all. You're a band her face. It flared, brightening even the undergrowth. Movement caught her eye as something hissed. A snake, finally. She crashed forward to the little clearing where the reptile coiled. It was about as big around as her arm. And when she drew within a pace, it reared up and struck. Fangs snagged on the tattered hem of her pants, but missed her flesh. Devon yelped and flipped her grip on the knife to stab downward. With its fang tangled, the reptile couldn't dodge. The knife punctured scales behind the animal's skull. A combat alert flashed in Devon's vision, but she quickly swiped it away, issuing a mental command to, dis to disable non-critical pop-ups in combat. The snake wrenched free of her trousers and slithered back, coiling for another strike. Glistening in the light from the wisp, a drop of venom beaded on one of the inch-long fangs, Devon circled carefully. Hesbeck probably had a recipe for jungle antidote minor, but Devon had less than zero interest in tasting it. Blood seeped from the wound on the back of the snake's neck. It didn't appear to slow the reptile's movement. As the snake struck again, 
Devin snatched a leafy branch and yanked it into the space between them. The snake ate a mouthful of twigs, and Devin sprang. She sliced at the beast's body, cutting deep. With a twist of her wrist, she felt the snake's spine snap. The reptile went limp. The jungle around her chimed. Congratulations, you have reached level two. Beginning the skinning process caused the snake to fall apart. She grabbed the items arrayed on the muddy jungle floor. You have received one snake skin, poor. One snake meat, two tree viper poison glands. She dropped the loot into her bag and stood. The wisp continuing around, slowly circling in the air overhead. Not bad, it said. Oh, the wisp, I'm the wisp. Not bad, it said. Though if being champion of Isildar is your destiny, no offense, but there are far more powerful forces ensuring the city's continued decay than a garden snake. First of all, it was a tree viper. Second, against the glare. Ishildar is not mine. She belongs to no one. If you remember nothing else, remember that. Devon blew out an exasperated breath. Fine. Maybe we can talk about your... The mm -hmm. hmm. spoilers right. that would so I think just it's the last two scenes. They're in a rumbling brought her bolt upright. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So just search for rumbling. You'll find it. Okay, and then we want it to end on. Okay, so the last two scenes. So. There's going to be another chapter break and then the end of the chapter. Okay, cool. It's pretty short. It, I, I thought it could go on, but it kind of gives... I, I, I like some of the voices and things for this part, so... Cool. Stone Guardian. Apparently, it was just another feature of Relic Online. The orb had gone out, no doubt fizzled when she'd fallen asleep. Outside, weak light painted the area around the outcroppings. The storm must have moved on, leaving light cloud cover. The front edge of the cave still dripped, but it didn't seem like any rain was still falling. She stiffened when another rumble came from outside. Moments later, a frustrated shout split the night. Devon scrambled to the front of the cave. What the hell? She peered across the open area. Her dark vision augmented the faint glow of the cloud-veiled moon. There, past the open area of bare stone, a mule-drawn wagon cut a shadow from the jungle behind. Around eight figures clustered around the vehicle, one tugging on the mule's halters. Okay, this is a dwarf, right? Yes. Come on, you damn beasts! Pull! The animals tossed their, he tossed their heads and strained against their harnesses, but the wagon scarcely rocked. Devon shook her head in amazement. What kind of idiots would try to take a wagon through this jungle? She slipped out of the cave and edged through the rubble, staying low to avoid being seen. It appeared that no, it appeared that one of the wagon's wheels had gotten mired in some particularly deep and sticky mud. No doubt, the heap of canvas-covered cargo in the wagon bed only made the mule's tasks harder. Devon slipped closer still and noticed that the figures were shorter and stocky than she'd first gathered. Full beards brushed out over their chests, and they wore a mixture of chain mail and heavy leather. Dwarves. Other than the ogre patriarch, for formerly known as Uroquat, they were the first non-human race she'd seen. Two of the dwarves held torches high above the scene. In the glow, Devon tried to make out what might be covered by that tarp, but it was lashed down tight. She considered offering help, but decided to watch and wait a little longer. An attempt to inspect them with combat assessment returned a non-committal statement about the idiocy of attacking eight dwarves by herself. I told you we shouldn't have left the mountains, one of the men said. By the comparatively short length of his beard, Devon guessed him to be one of the Yarborn coming to Altera, taken up mining. Our old trading partners don't need the iron and weapons we use to provide. Devon perked up. Weapons? 
That would be awesome for the village, but it could be very bad if these dwarves had sharp steel and reason to be angry. One of them, a dwarf wearing dark chainmail, detached from the crowd and started... I had a pop-up, sorry. Started stomping her way. Devon shrank back, hoping he'd turn aside, but he continued straight for her. Crap. She looked around for better cover but saw nothing. On instinct, she glanced down at her feet and the faint shadow drawn by the moon. Casting Shadow Puppet, she drew the darkness up around her. You have learned a new skill. Fade, Tier 1. You seem to melt into the shadows, gaining plus 20 to your hide skill. Scales up with cunning. Your surroundings must make sense for this to spell... Your surroundings must make sense for this spell to succeed. If turned into a shadow on a bare, sun-baked landscape, you're going to be pretty obvious. She raised the bow and pointed the bolt straight at Devon's forehead. One more scene. Just winning smile, she hoped her 25 charisma was good for more than growing her mana pool. We are just explorers, much like you seem to be. Oh, I think that's the dwarf. I think. Oh, no, you're right. Sorry. It's Devin, yeah. yeah. We're just explorers, much like you seem to be. The dwarf on the ground growled and rose to his feet, warhammer clutched in his fist. My, the stones. I think this lass is a... The dwarf near the wagon shifted, unseeming ready to speak. After a moment, the close dwarf lowered his, war his warhammer. Convince me why we shouldn't just dispatch with you alive if our clan wants to survive. Devon drew a deep breath and extinguished her orb. She lowered her arms and showed her palms in a conciliatory gesture. After a moment, she smiled again. That's how politicians did it, right? Smile no matter what? To start, I'd like to offer our help in getting your wagon out of the quagmire, out of that quagmire, she said though I'd venture it would be easier in the morning. These rocks have plenty of caverns. What do you say we join forces at sunup? The dwarf, apparently the leader, glanced back at his clan. Oh, I know this isn't some ploy for you to ambush us in our sleep, Dordan asked. The truth is, I don't like my odds, regardless of whether half of you are asleep, Devon said. Maybe it wasn't a good idea to show weakness, but this group would soon see that her three followers weren't combat trained. No matter how good a player she was, she wouldn't fare well against eight armed and armored dwarves. Dordan stroked his beard, then grunted. Fair. And perhaps, Devon said as more ideas crowded into her head, perhaps we could talk about other ways we... Chapter 34? Oh, 33. It's uh, the last scene of 33 and 34. Okay. So that's... Outside the temple, it looks like, is the first line. Yeah. This is when um, Devon has been, has discovered players in her area, and she's worried about... <laughs> what they might do when they find the NPCs in her village. Okay. She's worried about griefing. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's only the last scene of 33. Oh, okay. Um, so the players have camped and um, Devon's come with one of her NPCs to deal with them when they log back in. Okay. They've uh, they've devised a bit of uh, trickery. Yes. Outside the temple, birdsong filled the forest. Leaves rustled as small animals moved. Rustled as small animals moved through the undergrowth. Devon approached cautiously and leaned her ear toward the entrance, listening for voices. The players hadn't yet returned. She waved Hesbeck forward, and they entered the first room together. If they arrive early, you know what to do, right? Devin asked. The medicine woman nodded. Devin really hoped the players didn't log back in before she was ready, 
but it was nice to have a plan just in case. As Hesbeck stepped to the edge of the room and put her back against the wall, Devon cast a glowing orb, then reached through the door into the next room and placed it on the wall. Electric blue light filled the chamber, glowing off the thick cobwebs in the corners. Devon grimaced. She didn't like spiders any more than that warrior, but she didn't have time to be choosy. Drawing her dagger, she stepped into the room. The webs erupted with life as five dog-sized spiders uncurled and clambered down the walls. She rushed across the floor to they rushed across the floor toward her, eyes glittering. Devon took a step back and swung with her dagger, catching one of the spiders along its right side. Her strike, sev her strike severed four legs, and the, ar the arachnid fell over sideways. It squirmed on the floor, alive but neutralized. Just as she started to get cocky, another spider leaped. It latched onto her forearm and bit down, fangs puncturing her skin. Ouch! she yelled, shaking the thing off. The wound ached. At the edge of her vision, she saw red. Damn, she hated the pain response in this game. She kicked as another spider lunged, knocking it aside but doing no damage. A wave of nausea hit her. The scene wavered. Shit. Poison. Clenching her teeth, Devon circled around the wall of the room and cast Flame Strike. The burning pillar lanced through the ceiling and sizzled one of the spiders. It shrieked, shriveling as it drew its leg through her. She, her health dropped to 75%. Devon backed away, the spiders following her like a pack of dogs. She swung wildly with the dagger, and they nimbly dodged back. One spat, and yellow venom splattered on her cheek. Her health dropped to 70%. At the edge of her awareness, she felt the restriction on flame strike ease. The spell had a five-second cooldown, and during that time, she found she just couldn't put her mind through the necessary steps to cast it. Now, though, she took another step back and called down fire. Another spider squealed and died. The poison ticked again, knocking her down to 65% health. As she staggered, one of the spiders lashed out with a leg, slicing her across the skin. She gagged at the pain and limped back. The sudden eruption of chattering, of chittering, the sudden eruption of chittering and hissing and clicking feet told her she'd taken one step too far into the next room, the temple's main chamber. She cast a panicked glance over the, her shoulder and saw another dozen pair of eyes glittering, pairs of eyes glittering in the light of her glowing orb. Flame Strike was ready again, and she knocked the life from one of the last two spiders in the room with her, then leaped over the other. She looked at the advancing horde and shook her head. She was going to die here. Might as well try everything she could. Besides, the major point of taking the sorcerer class was to create new, interesting light sources to exploit her deceiver abilities. It was a useless choice unless she actually tried to use the combos. Jaw clenched, she willed her shadow puppet to rise from the ground. Edges crackling like black electricity, the dark figure rose. Devon kicked at the lone spider near her, sending it sliding away, then gritted her teeth and forced her shadow to dart into the other room. Sparks erupted from her puppet, cascading over her, over the herd of spiders. Arachnids screeched and died, falling in concentric circles from the locus where her shadow stood with arms spread wide. She watched the wave of electricity approach, cringed, stared at her health bar as she braced for the pain. The spider in front of her squeaked but kept coming. Pain leaped up her legs. Pain lapped up her legs. Devon, Hesbeck called as another wave of poison shook her. Devon's health was down 30% as she turned to look at the woman. Hesbeck pulled a pot from her rack suck and tossed it over. You have received... Jungle Antidote Minor. The spiders in the other room were and poured the liquid down her throat. The taste was as foul as Jungle Healing Potion Minor, but disgusting in a different way. Immediately, her vision cleared. None of the remaining spiders were fast enough to harm her. 
Devin grabbed the glowing orb off the wall and waded into the writhing mass. One by one, she put the things out of their misery. For a moment, the temple was silent until a loud chime shook the walls. Congratulations! You have reached level nine. You have gained four attribute points. You have gained mastery in glowing orb, tier two, one percent. You have gained mastery in shadow puppet, tier one, three percent. You can come in now, she said as she caught her breath. Hesbeck shuffled forward. Devon searched the perimeter of the temple's main chamber. Cobwebs hung in curtains from the ceilings and covered much of the architecture. In a little alcove, there was a stone hatch that probably led to some sort of catacombs. Yet another thing that would interest the players. She gathered some rubble and strewed it over the top of the hatch just in case they made, this, they made it this far. As she looked back over the rooms filled with nearly twenty spider corpses, she wondered whether she could loot them. Better to leave the bodies, but it was hard to pass up the chance. Still, she doubted she'd get much besides random spider parts. Better to have the plan succeed. Hesbeck crept somewhat tentatively into the final chamber. It's been a long time since I was this close to battle. You fought well. Devon smiled. Then let's finish what we came here to do. Hesbeck straightened, looking very serious. But the gleam in her eyes made Devon wonder if the older woman was enjoying the adventure more than she let on. Don't we need to group up? The woman said. Devon laughed. <laughs> You're right. It's my own plan, and I forgot that part. She hadn't known it was possible to group with an NPC, but she was glad, seeing as Hesbeck's part wouldn't work on conscious players unless they were part of a group. The invite popped up in her interface, asking if she would like to group with Hesbeck. When Devon accepted, the group interface sprang up, showing her Hesbeck's health and mana. Pretty standard. All right. This has got to happen fast. We can't give them time to pay a lot of attention to me. I remember, Hesbeck said with a faint smile to suggest she didn't really need the review. Okay, then, Devon said as she stepped into a beam of sunlight that fell through the temple's vault. She brought her sun-cast shadow puppet to life, then formed it into a set of narrow blades that she wedged into cracks in the stone ceiling at the temple's main entrance. Next, she cast Fade on herself and sat back to wait. The players entered in a flash of light, first the cleric, then the warrior. As soon as they stood, Devon cast Freeze on her shadow, encasing the thin blades in ice. She quickly followed with a flame strike, targeting the roof. Freeze Thaw, freeze thaw Cycle. Thank you, high school geology, she muttered as the tunnel entrance collapsed. Blocks loosened just enough to ex blocks loosened just enough by the expansion of ice in the cracks. The players yelled and backed away from the falling stone and dust as Hesbeck ran into the room. The players whirled, the warrior drawing his sword. Oh no their shadow puppet, bringing it to life in the temple's main chamber. Stretch its substance thin, she formed it into the shape of a house sized spider. With the ventriloquist ability, she made the thing shriek. Holy shit, the warrior mumbled as he raised his sword. While the players were distracted, Hesbeck had begun casting. Devon heard a thunderclap as her stomach suddenly flew into her throat. Her feet landed on bare stone, and high-altitude sun lanced her eyes. Devon blinked away tears as the glow of the teleport spell faded. The party was standing on a trail on a high peak overlooking rolling farmland that had to be the Elterra mentioned to her. She used ventriloquism and caused a low growl to rise from the cleft in the stone behind the players. Hesbeck's eyes widened. Oh no! But she focused... Yeah, it's really choppy. And I don't know... I don't know how... Oh no. I don't know how bad it was, or if at least we'll have a good recording on YouTube, but...
Sorry, I hope, folks. I hope what people did see, they enjoyed. We did have a little bit of an audience while we were going. And I think maybe people dropped out. Thank um, you, Carrie Summers. Thanks, you guys. That was great. So fun to watch you guys work. And we're about, we're almost, uh, we're almost done Just doing retakes for, for the audiobook now. Yeah, so we're on the last sec, the last cluster. The last, <laughs> the last, I, the sequel. And what is the sequel called? Fortress of Shadows. Fortress of Shadows. That is Stonehaven League Yay. book two. So go pick that up, guys, if you have read the first one already. If you can't wait for the first one on Audible. I'm it's... starting on that one tonight. Yeah. So um... I'm reading it. I'm starting on reading it tonight. Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, just uh, keep an eye out. Go pick up the Kindle versions if you haven't read them yet. And uh, I guess we will see you on the next Sound Booth Theater Live. Thanks, you guys.